Hello, everyone. My name is Chet Moy Jr. I am the former chief commissioner of the Denver Police Review Board. I'm also a political strategist. Some of you may be familiar with my work as the campaign manager of Harlem for Obama. I am honored to be a moderator today for what I'm sure will be a lively discussion about this historic building, 170 West 130th Street and its important role as the national headquarters for the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, featuring the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This building was designed by architect and builder William J. Merritt in, 19, in 1884. The facade was revised in 1928 by Vertner Woodson Tandy, who was the first African-American architect to be licensed in the state of New York. He is one of the few, and this is one of the few known remaining works of TND. The building fortunately will remain as a protected from demolition entity because it is located in a historic district. The building is also listed as an NYC LGBT historic site, principally because of the March on Washington's chief organizer, Bayard Russin, who was openly gay. We have with us today, people who can speak firsthand about what went on in that building. The personalities that commandeered the operation and the magnitude and gravity of their mission. It was huge. Allow me to introduce our esteemed panelists. Dr. Joyce Latner. Dr. Joyce Landner is a civil rights activist, author, and sociologist. Dr. Landner served as the interim president of Howard University. At the age of 19, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee organizer was brought from Mississippi to New York to raise the funding that enabled activists and many, many Southerners to attend the march. Cortland Cox. Cortland Cox is a Washington, D.C. business consultant who drafted D.C. small minority business legislation. He was appointed by President Bill Clinton to serve as the director of the Minority Business Development Agency at the Department of Commerce. But in 1963, he served as SNCC's representative on the steering committee for the March on Washington. Lynn Kilgore Hindi. Lynn Kilgore Hindi is a former media and TV rating sales representative, but she is also the daughter of the late great Reverend Thomas Kilgore Jr., Reverend Dr. Thomas Kilgore Jr., that is, who was head of SELC's New York chapter. The Reverend Dr. Thomas Kilgore Jr. was the pastor of Friendship Baptist Church, which owned the headquarters building and provided staff support for the operation. Ms. Hendy knows intimately the roles her famous father and the Friendship Baptist Church played on planning the March on Washington. And she spent a lot of time as a young girl in that building during the planning. Rochelle Horwitz. Rochelle Horwitz is the former political director of the American Federation of Teachers in Washington, DC. Raquel Horowitz is, was the personal assistant to Bayer Rustin, who was the principal organizer of the 1963 March. Raquel helped run the national headquarters and served as his transportation coordinator. It was she who managed the transport of leaders, organizations, and marchers to and from Washington, DC. So let's get started. We're anxious. I remember being um, excited, overwhelmed, and so important, uh, and and felt such a tremendous sense of humility. I guess that I was one of the few people who um, on staff who was organizing this march. Um, I had come from Mississippi, as you indicated earlier. He was a member of SNCC. And 
one day I got a call from Ruba Doris Robinson, a Smith rather, who's, um, I used to call her the general of SNCC. She kept the, the train moving on time. Anyway, she said, Joyce, I want you to be on the, um, represent SNCC on the staff of the march. And she said that each civil rights organization was asked to send two representatives. So you and Cortland Cox here uh, will be the SNCC representatives. And that's how it happened. I, I mean, I, I, I thought it was just fantastic. And it's my first trip to New York City, or to New York, period. And um, it was a very exciting place. Harlem was a very exciting place for me. I mean, it was so, um, it was it was really nice to go to New York. Um, I thought it was supposed to be started out as a vacation uh, from the South. That was not uncommon for uh, SNCC, friends of SNCC members in the North often hosted young people um, to come up and get some R and R. And while there, then I got this call from Ruby Doris, who um, told me that I should go on up to Harlem and work. And then the first thing I did was, I was told that I was going to stay with my sister and I, she was there as well. She worked at the Francis Nick office raising, right. anyway, she, uh, to wrap this up, uh, they told us that we were going to stay with a, a young woman named Rochelle Horowitz. And uh -huh. this is how we met Rochelle. So <laughs> we stayed in the ILGWU um, condos. It was her first apartment. Um, and there were four of us there, my sister, Dory, uh, of course, Rochelle, and then Eleanor Holmes, who later became Eleanor Holmes Norton. Really, really, the congresswoman. Yeah. She was a, um, a, a Yale law student. And she came um, to Rochelle's maybe a couple of weeks after we were there. And she also worked on the march. She was, by the way, the last, by it said there, Asked for volunteers to stay behind just in case there were phone call, critical phone calls, right. other things. So she stayed behind. The rest of us left the day before the march on a train to go down to DC. And uh, Eleanor was happy to get a plane ride. <laughs> the next day. And she, over, she said she'll always remember flying over that large crowd. <laughs> so, uh, Rochelle, how do you remember 1963? Well, I guess in retrospect, 1963 was the highlight of my life. Now, then it was just a period of uh, tremendous activity and, 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 and hopes and then tremendous tragedy, but, and, but trying to deal with, with it. Um, yeah. I had been working with Byard since 1957 uh, when I worked on a committee to support the Montgomery bus boycott. Right. And so I was lucky enough to work with him and Norman Hill uh, and Tom Kahn in the pre-planning of the march. That is, uh, they did a memo to Dr. To Mr. Randolph for the march. We worked downtown. Um, and finally, when, every, when we had the six, um, big six chairman and we were definitely going to do the march, we moved to, um, we moved to Harlem. And that was a great day. Um, and it seemed to me that we worked every minute of 1963, especially leading up uh, to the march. And it was just, it was just, it was a period of immense hope. Uh, in, in the words of John Lewis, I think we all thought we could create a beloved community. Um, so you, you, you wound up going to that building uh, upon the in invitation of the Reverend Dr. Uh, Kildor. Kildor, yeah, Kildor I, it's, Jr. It's, and, it's, yeah, I think Reverend Kilgore was Tom uh, Tom Byard's go-to pastor. Ah. So he, <laughs> <laughs> if he needed something, he went to Reverend Kilgore, and Reverend Kilgore um, gave him the building. Uh, and, right. and I said earlier that I feel very badly that we didn't film the inside of the building. I don't think any of us had a sense <laughs> of history. I mean, what had been wonderful, that is there were three floors with immense activity ultimately going on every minute of the day from volunteers coming in from the streets, um, mailing out 
because we had to use mail, um, mailing out leaflets and buttons to every civil rights leader who at some point um, came to that building, not to mention all of us working there. It would have been lovely if we could have seen that again, but I think we were all rightly focused on Washington. Lynn, what do you remember about your father at that time? And, you know, his, his uh, relationship, there are a lot of people just, just adore him. Uh, historically, he's, he's been so important. Yes, um, he was an important figure. He was a very good friend to Dr. King. Yes. Um, a long time friend. A long also. time friend. He started working with him in the fifties. And but where did he Alabama. meet him? Where did my, my father? Where live? did your father meet Dr. King? He met Dr. King. Um, funny story at Morehouse when ah. he was when my father was a student at Morehouse. He often visited the King home. Um, he became friends with the Kings, and he was actually Dr. King's babysitter. <laughs> Uh, so that's how he met him. He met him as a boy. And, ah, and then yes. as he grew into a man and went to his ministry in Alabama, um, daddy kept up with him and kept up with the civil rights struggle because he, my father, had been in the civil rights struggle himself since the early 40s yes. in North Carolina. Yes. And it was just something that was instilled in him that, you know, there should be equality and justice for black folks in America. And my sister and I were raised with that ethic. And in 1963, when I was 16, um, I had a job downtown mm -hmm. and I worked from seven in the morning till three in the afternoon. And then most afternoons I would come up to the House of Friendship, which is what the building was known as. Um, it was the community center for the Friendship Baptist Church. Yes, yes. And we came, I came to the House of Friendship and I did, I know maybe Rochelle, you probably told me something to do. <laughs> um, I, I don't remember that specifically, but I do remember that we helped with mailings. There were other teenagers from the church. Um, we just did whatever we were asked to do. Leaf weren't, you, weren't you working at that time also? Had a real job uh, I was, besides I was your volunteer working, job? I was working as a counter waitress at Chock Full of Nuts <laughs> downtown on uh, Park Avenue. And I would come up after my work day. But, you know, I was 16, so I had yeah. unlimited energy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I just remember, um, as Rochelle said, the, the buzzing activity in that building was just unbelievable. And um, as I said to Chet yesterday, my most clear memory of that time was of Bayard Rustin. Yes. And his just boundless energy, he was always on the phone, he was always smoking. <laughs> and, and what I remember most about him was his voice. <laughs> and and his diction. I had never heard a black person talk the way Bayard Rustin did. And it was just mesmerizing to me as a 16 year old girl. So um, my sister worked at the SCLC office during the March. She um, was kind of like the girl Friday there. That was like her first paying job. So my father had put us both to work on the March on Washington. And we will be eternally grateful to him for that. <laughs> Cortland, there were some very important players in that operation. What do you remember about 1960? Well, I remember, I, the thing I remember is the energy. Uh -huh. uh, and I would say both on the streets on Harlem and also in the building. I was fortunate because I was part of the discussions of the big six in terms of what's the strategy, you know, who would be doing what, whether we would be seeing Kennedy before or after the, um, the, the march, uh, mm -hmm. whether Kennedy would speak at the march on Washington. Uh, there were a number of issues that Bayard had, had to negotiate. But I must also say that besides Bayard, uh, I was really impressed by A. Philip Randolph. Oh, yeah. He was the man who really held the coalition together. He was the one that, I mean, speaking of the, the uh, diction and, and ability to speak, Bayard was one thing, but A. Philip Randolph was another. He was really 
You know, he looked like he had come from another century in terms of the way he presented him. The, the other thing, I, in terms of the energy, the energy in the streets in Harlem. I mean, if you walked on 125th Street, you would hear the Isley Brothers singing Twist and Shout when people <laughs> were trying to get you into the stores. If you went up to 125th Street and 7th Avenue, people were on all the corners on ladders talking about Africa, talking about this issue, talking about that issue. So what I remember about Harlem at that period was the energy both inside the building and outside the building. Uh, like, so this, this was a, an enormous operation. You know, the, yes. the, the fundraising, the organizing, the contacting the people, the collection of the buses and commandeering that. Uh, tell us about that, because this was a, a totally different time. You got all those people down to Washington. Not only did you get them down there, you got them down there safely and got them back. So how how was that operation? How did you do it? I mean, this in this age. You know, I, you know, did you, did you use your, your Twitter machine? Did you use, <laughs> <laughs> who's good? Did you have a Facebook event? Well, yeah. I mean, what, what happened? Well, I, I think people need to understand is this was done in 90 days. Yeah. So, I mean, while there was pre-planning and stuff for the actual organization and as Amazing. Rochelle uh, mentioned, I mean, it was it was pen and paper and mimeograph machine. It wasn't so. I mean, I just think that there are a couple of things that were very much in our favor. The first, and I think Joyce talked about it a bit, is that people, the black community, was in motion. You got whether you're talking about in Birmingham or in Mississippi or in Southwest Georgia or so forth. They were in motion. Uh, the second thing is that the labor movement, particularly with Walter Ruther, was you know, fairly well organized and very strong mm -hmm. uh, in terms of this. And you had a liberal community that was fairly uh, open to, because things had just been beginning to open up. So while the organization was particularly important, what made it possible was that the three groups that made com compose the, the people who came to the march were in motion. So therefore it was not, you didn't have to go convince them that they needed to come. They were ready to come and what they needed was a vehicle that would get them there. So I would it, like to add just one more group to that, which was the, the black churches. Yes, right. yes. yes. Um, that were really instrumental in getting people there and organizing people and getting buses together. I mean, I think every church in Harlem that I know of sent at least two buses to the march. And, and that was happening all over the country. So the, the church community was very um, influential as well. Yes. Yeah. I, I just wanted to agree with Cortland and, and with Lynn. The building was an organizational hub. It is because- Right. All, all the, every major um, civil rights organization participated. The Black Church, the National Council of of of, of churches, um, Catholic groups, women's groups, and I think part of what made that building such a hub was the energy on the streets of Harlem, the impetus of people who wanted a march, and we had something that I think may substitute for cell phones and Twitter and Instagram, we had organizations raring to go. There you go. Who could absolutely, <laughs> that is once they made a decision, they could communicate with their membership. So the black pastors went out and got the churches done. So the reason we did it in 90 days without, without all this newfangled technology was human beings and very serious organizations. Talking about Harlem itself, um, did, did Harlem, did the headquarters being positioned in Harlem and in New York City facilitate this fire in Northerners to get involved directly in the march and into the civil rights movement that was already, you know, red hot in, in the South? Did the, did the position of the headquarters in New York City, Harlem, matter to that? I'm not, uh, sure, I'm not sure how to answer that, but I can tell you 
it could not have been organized anywhere in the United States but New York. Right. Sorry. I mean, I mean, the the, the, the march on because everybody everybody's here. Anybody, I mean, they I mean, with, who could do it were they lived in New York and, right. and, and, and so New York was essential to making it happen. Now, I'm not sure about the other issues, but it clearly was essential to making it happen. I think, so. I think it had to be Harlem and everybody knew Harlem was the capital of black America. Right. There you go. And it's where all the uh, intellectual and vitality and debate. I mean, A. Philip Randolph had started his life standing in the street debating in Harlem. Right. And Malcolm X con uh, continued not in the ideological tradition, but in the tradition. Um, so I don't think there was any question that it had to be out of Harlem. I, I agree with that. And, and it's certainly the intellectual energy the Harlem community. Also, uh, it was a safe space to organize. Yes. Uh, and in Atlanta or New Orleans, and certainly in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, yeah. where there are <laughs> active movements, Police would have come in and broken it up, you know, put a padlock on the door of the of the building, and so on. So it was a safe space. It was an encouraging space, um, but it was it was the tremendous support, infrastructure support, um, and volunteer support, and the money, you know, that was raised out of New York. And and I think I think one thing that you know people were really surprised that so much was happening in that building because. If I remember correctly, it was very sparsely furnished. <laughs> uh, I mean, there was just nothing there. You know, like a couple of desks and chairs. And I bet phones. you had plenty of phones, though. They oh, had yeah. phones, yeah, but yeah, there was it. It certainly was not luxury. Right. And uh, I think people were surprised that so much good work came out of such a humble space. Exactly. Um, that building, though sparsely furnished had a courtyard also sparse, sparsely furnished. And um, Byron was, de was determined that the only policemen that would be used in the march, the army, would be people we provided, that he wanted the Kennedys at one point offered all sorts of support. He wanted them watching the perimeters of the march, the, na the Nazis and people who were gonna disrupt it. And, um, there was a, I think Valerie, you told me they still exist. It's the Guardians, it's a black yeah. fraternal organization in the police department. And there's another one in the fire department. And Bill Johnson, who you will see um, wearing a white hat standing behind Dr. King when he speaks, right. um, was the head of them. And they, they volunteered to be at the march. I'll try to make this quickly, um, but this is 57 years ago. And these were black policemen who volunteered to be monitors of the march. And they understood, and Bayard understood, that they needed training in nonviolence and in nonviolent crowd containment. So every day, at some point in the day, Bayard would take 15 or 20 of whichever volunteers appeared, and they would go back into the courtyard. And he would teach them nonviolent encirclement, that if, if some problem happened, you link arms and you walk quietly and you push them and you act in a friendly manner. Um, and it is an amazing story because, of course, the march was very peaceful. Um, the Guardians went down and did it. And the second part of that was that in New York City at that point, a policeman had to carry his gun 24 hours a day. And Bayard didn't want any guns in Washington. And so he went with a bunch of people to Mayor Wagner. This is a different political. And, and um, Jackie Robinson called Governor Rockefeller. And that statute was removed so that they could come to Washington mm -hmm. without guns. Um, it is, of course, interesting to know that 57 years ago, Black policemen and Bayard all understood that they needed training in nonviolence. Right, right. 